Welcome to the e Success Methods Podcast with Jacob and Aaron, your weekly dose of tips and tricks to achieve excellent performance in your business and career. Join us as we explore deeper into the practical worlds of Lean, Six Sigma, project management, and design thinking. In this episode number 190D, we continue with stage four of the audio release of A Business Carol. To get the full commercial free release, fill out the form at esuccess-methods.com slash book releases, or email me, Aaron, A-A-R-O-N, at esuccess-methods.com. If you like this episode, be sure to click the like link in the show notes. It's easy. Just tap our logo, click, and you're done. Tap, click, done. Here we go. Stave 4. A future of our own making. Still energized by Deming's visit, I was sitting in my bed, playing with the idea of making another pot of tea when the room darkened and grew cold. I shivered, and I was drawing the comforter around my shoulders when I caught sight of something in the far corner of the room. My breath caught as I realized it was a tall, thin figure of a person in a long, heavy cloak. Buck up, I told myself. This must be Christmas future. How bad can it be? The figure silently glided toward me. Every fiber in my being wanted to run away, screaming like a little girl. But how do you outrun your own mind, or an already consumed pot of tea that was clearly spiked with street drugs? The phantom drew closer. I steadied myself, trying to busy my mind with the technology needed to create a garment that not only reflected no light at all, but seemed to suck the light from the entire room. Nope, not working. Every cell is still voting to run away screaming, and they're getting quite persuasive. The apparition came to a halt, only inches away. He, she, had to be over seven feet tall. I tried to spy its facial features, but all I could make out under the voluminous hood was a pair of glowing flames where the eyes should be. The apparition stretched out an arm forward, I squeezed my eyes shut and prayed, Please, please, please. No skeleton hand, no skeleton hand, no skeleton hand. Finally, and slowly, I opened my eyes. A little girl's squeak slipped out. I really can't stand skeleton hands. I glanced toward the door to calculate the trajectory of my escape. The skeleton hand swung out, palm open toward my face, to block my view and sent me scuttling backward onto the bed. Now, feeling quite boxed in, and panting uncontrollably, I stared up at the creature before me. Lulu, look, I really can't deal with the skeleton thing. There's a reason God gave us skin. We're not supposed to see the innards. If I'm going to learn anything from you, you're going to have to do something about the bones thing. I cowered on the bed, waiting for some sort of blow or act of otherworldly evil to fall upon me. To my surprise, the apparition straightened tugged at its sleeve, and folded it over his bony hand so that I only saw the robe. That act of kindness gave me courage to continue. Well, who am I kidding? I really had no choice. I could have curled into the fetal position and cried like baby, but with my luck, it had nowhere to go and would have waited me out. I'm not the most social person myself, so I can relate to that. Sitting up on the bed, so your Christmas future... There was barely a perceptible affirmative nod from the hooded one. And you're not going to talk at all? A barely perceptible negative nod. Hmm. Texting? Another negative. And email. Out of the question? It shoved the robe and closed hand toward me. Do we have to hold hands, or can I just, well, just touch you somewhere non-bony? The hooded one moved the long sleeve of its robe closer. I reached a trembling hand, trying for a reasonably grateful smile on my face. Thanks? When my finger touched the icy cold cloth, we were suddenly flying through darkness. Despite the pitch black, or maybe because of it, a stream of images began to flow past my mind's eye. Great glaciers calved massive chunks into the ocean. Then both the chunks and the glaciers melted away like ice chips on the hood of a black car left in the hot summer sun. Billowing clouds of smoke engulfed the entire southwestern U.S. as we drew near. Red and orange, tongued flames danced everywhere on the ground as far as the eye could see. A massive cloud front covered the entire eastern seaboard in great hurricane swirls driving 100 mile an hour winds that sucked the very ocean away, while dumping foot upon foot of rain only to slam the ocean back into the beaches, carrying boats hundreds of feet on shore. We passed over deserts swarming with munitions from the land, the air, and everywhere in between. At the rearwood edge, bodies of the dead piled in great heaps just outside the tent cities, 
where doctors worked furiously to stem the tide of destruction in their little patch of the world. Finally, we came to a stop in a large auditorium-type room. It had once been well-appointed, with electronics built into each chair, but now the electronics were little more than a tangled mess of wires and devices thrown about the room like hastily tossed Christmas tree tinsel. The people in the room jostled loudly and physically against each other, demanding attention from a small group of people who stood behind a wall of armed guards with plexiglass shields in the front of the room. I could only pick out brief phrases from the cacophony, flooding, cholera, food shortage, thousands of dead with no means of burial, border incursions, crop thefts. I was so caught up in trying to pick out snippets of information that I didn't notice the boy running down our row of chairs until he was on top of me and shoving past. I stepped back to clear his way and bumped full body into someone behind me. I turned around to make my apology, and there stood the hooded one. I squeaked and jumped away. I'm s so sorry you're, uh, boniness. I'm just not good under some types of pressure. There was an acknowledging nod of the hood, and I stepped over to the side of the hooded one. Overcome with curiosity, I leaned toward it and asked, What's going on here? The hooded one gestured a covered hand to me. A newspaper lying on the table in the row in front of me. I leaned over the chair and picked up the paper. The headline read, Special UN meeting to be held for all member and non-member countries to discuss current global conditions. The masthead read the year 2095. I suddenly felt shaky and had to steady myself with my hand on the back of the seat in front of me. The idea of being so far away forward into the future made me a bit nauseated. I saw the hooded one raising an arm from the corner of my eye and tried to gesture it away, saying, That's okay. I'll be fine in just a... My hand touched the robe, and we were off. Flying through the pitch black, the hooded one has no bedside manner. Finally, we stopped. Or at least, I think we stopped. My stomach was still turning somersaults of its own. We were in a tent city, brimming with people in various stages of malnourishment. Stifling hot, humid air pressed a stench into every pore of my being. It was a reek so vile that my body tried both to refuse to inhale, while at the same time trying to wretch my toenails out past my tonsils. The hooded one moved before me and offered the robe-wrapped hand. I looked up through tearing eyes. If I touch your robe, will we leave this awful place? That was a negative. So then you're offering to help me walk? That was an affirmative. That's okay. I winced in pain as I tried to walk upright while retching. No offense, but I think I can make it. I began to hobble after him as he led the way between the rows of tattered tarps fashioned into shelters and passed a sign that read, St. Medicine's Homeless Compound. I was gingerly avoiding the raw sewage streams that meandered through when I noticed that we were moving toward the edge. My hopes for less putrid air began to rise despite my no's insistence that any idea of fresh air was futile. The closer we drew to the edge, the stronger the smell grew. Finally, we were within thirty feet of the edge, and a large group of people huddled at the end of the alleyway moved away, revealing something behind them that my mind struggled to comprehend. Then in a flash of insight, I'd worked it out. The group had been delivering a body to the top of a pile of bodies. My brain forgot to retch, forgot to breathe. A wave of disbelief slowly rocked through my body as my brain screamed, That's a pile of dead bodies! And I forgot to look away. My eyes, wholly abandoned, to do nothing but stare straight ahead, the small details becoming more clear with each passing second. The pile teemed with maggots and the occasional rodent. I wanted to fall over and puke, but my body remained paralyzed in its upright position. I became painfully aware that the fetid, humid air was bridging the gap that I'd been unwilling to cross of my own volition. It was carrying molecules of odor from that pile of... It was pressing them into my very soul. I wished for darkness, even death, because surely this image would never leave my mind for as long as I lived. You are listening to E6S Methods Podcast, brought to you by E6S Industries. Join us on our website at www.e6s-methods.com. Journey through success. Are you applying for professional certification in your field? You'll be happy to learn that all this time you've been streaming Jacob and me into your ears. 
You've also been earning Continuing Education Units, or CEUs, which can be applied toward most professional certifications. You can do your research, all the math, and figure out which episodes are applicable for which discipline, or you can save yourself the time and hassle and just order a CEU report from us. All you need to do is provide us with which episodes you've listened to, and we'll provide you with a portfolio including details about each episode and a certificate of recognition with a CEU breakdown by competency, including leadership, tactics and tools, strategy deployment, and principles and philosophies. So if you have certification on the mind, start here and save some time. Just go to e6s-methods.com slash CEU to order yours. The hooded one moved to my side and held the sleeve out close to me. I managed to slowly extend one index finger forward until the icy cloth pulled me away into blessed blackness. We landed near a serene mountain lake. A beautiful blue gem sat amidst gently swaying grasses, dotted with delicate white flowers and ringed in deep green fir trees. It smelled so wonderful. I fell to my knees and began puking my guts out. I'm not sure how long I hurled, but eventually, the hooded one placed a handful of green stemmy vines in front of me. I picked them up and studied them, then looked at the hooded one. Uh, thanks? The hooded one motioned to where the mouth and nose would be. I raised them to my nose and sniffed. Was that mint? Yes, mint. I looked up and the hooded one motioned again. You want me to eat these? That was affirmative. I took a single small sprig into my mouth and bit down, not sure what to expect. It was nice. Had a bit greenish tasting, but nice. Better still, it cleared the odor from my nostrils and taste from my mouth. Ah, finally. I sat back with a couple sprigs in my mouth, chewing on them as I enjoyed the warm sun on my face and the soft breeze at my back. I was just beginning to think the hooded one might not be all that bad after all, when gunfire rang out. Crap! What else was I expecting? I rolled down onto my stomach and low-crawled behind a rock where I could peek out and watch what was going on below. A group of people who must have been guarding the lake was rushing up the opposite slope toward a man who lay face down. That'll teach you to steal it ain't yours! They fell onto the body, ensuring it was dead and searching for any valuables. Then they stripped it of clothes and boots, tossing them to one of the group. There you go, Fred. These should fit you. Two men grabbed the body, one in each arm and began dragging it back to the top of the slope. The big one bellowed, Where's that dang sign? Another rushed forward, waving a large piece of cardboard in his hand. I got it right here. They hung the sign around the lifeless, nude body, now propped up against the rock. The big man in the group began to pound on the sign with each blow of his fist. Water thieves shot on sight. He slapped at the head of the corpse. Can't you read the damn sign? The group fell into the howls of laughter as they romped down the slope to the tents that I could now see among the fir trees. I rolled over to see the hooded one standing above me and gasped, Get down! Aren't you afraid of being shot? Even as the words left my mouth, my brain worked through the concept. The hooded one stood there and silently shrugged his shoulders. Guess we should be getting out of here now? That was affirmative. I reached up and touched the sleeve. We slipped easily through the blackness until we landed in the parking lot of a business park. Or maybe it was what used to be a business park. Even though it was midday, everything was shrouded in a gray haze. The parking lot looked to be filled with rows and rows of metal shipping containers. As I studied them, I realized that they were man doors cut into each one. What could they be storing so much of this close to the business? From an unseen speaker, a monotone voice announced, 9 a.m.? A rush of people came from the building and ran to the boxes, entering them from the man doors. As we stood there, the monotone voice announced, 9.05 a.m. Some of the people emerged from the metal boxes and hurried back inside. Then, when the monotone voice announced, 9.09 a.m., the remainder of the people rushed back into the building. Had they just taken a break in those boxes? What sense did that make? I noticed two men in a conversation at the far end of the row of shipping containers. Hooded one, can we go closer? That was affirmative. I crept closer to the two men until I could hear their conversation. The younger blonde leading against the shipping container was in the middle of a rant. People these days, they just do whatever they damn well feel like. The gray-haired guy sat on the grass nearby, relaxed and gazing across the complex. I guess it's their right. When everyone has guns, what are you going to do? Call the cops? Tell me about it. 
If the policy says no blood, no badge, then what are we even still paying them for? I don't know, some economy thing? Economy? What economy? Eight years of school and a PhD and for what? I'm a vice president, earning barely more than the guy that delivers my pizza. Well, that's the invisible hand, don't you know? Right, invisible hand, my pasty white behind. I've heard what it used to be like, that invisible hand smeared the economic landscape into one huge global mud pie. We studied it in school, like some ancient myth that all these people are still clinging to. We were goners as a nation the minute they abolished the minimum wage. But you have to admit that it does give a strange sort of freedom, everybody working for the same buck fitty. Right now I keep the books and do the tax returns for this place because I like it. But I can go pick up a job flipping burgers and hardly lose any wages. Plus, I'd get free lunch to boot. Technically, I'd be better off flipping burgers. The blonde banged his fist against the rusty container that he was leaning back against. Don't you ever just want to get out of these damn shed houses? I used to have a house. You're kidding me. Nope, serious as a heart attack. Inherited it free and clear and still had it till the bottom fell out of the wages. Then couldn't keep it no more. Couldn't pay the property taxes, and it got thrown into the foreclosure churn. You couldn't find any way at all to keep it? Sure, I could have signed up to rent it back from the holding company that bought it out of foreclosure for pennies on the dollar. But it's cheaper just to live here and get my housing plus one dollar and fifty cents. No more utility hassles, no more worrying about the government's going to toss you out without even a week's notice because the strip miners decided there's some mineral they want under it. The man lay back on the grass. Yep, much easier and simpler this way. How can you stand it? We need to restart the unions. Gray-haired man sat bolt up and looked around. Hey, hey, that's treason talk. You know they got years out here. You want to get us fired for colluding against business? The blonde pounded his fist backward onto the shipping container again, then kicked his foot back at it, then banged his head against it. What's the use? Well, you're still alive. Long as you're still alive, I guess there's hope. Hope for what? Well, if nothing else, hope that the sun comes back out tomorrow. You ever see it when there's a real whopper of a rain going through it and kills the electric power to all the plants? Yep, real pretty on those days. I've only ever seen it three times. The sky is so bright. Now don't call me nuts. But I could swear the last time it happened, the sky looked almost blue. Oh, you're not nuts. I remember hearing my dad talk about blue skies all the time. He said nearly every day you walked outside, there'd be this great stretch of the prettiest blue you could ever imagine, stretched clear from one horizon to the other. Wow, I can't imagine that. The blonde looked up at the sky. The monotone voice announced, 11 a.m., The old man struggled to his feet. Guess that's us. It was nice spending the day off together. When's your next day off? Oh, I suppose it's the a.m. in another three weeks. Well, I'm still new and only get a day every four weeks. The man laughed and put his arm around the blonde shoulder. Don't worry, kid. The first three years are the hardest. But once you get to the day every three weeks, it makes it all worth it. I watched as the two friends walked into the building together. When they disappeared through the doors, I turned to the hooded one. Would their lives ever change? That was a negative. Just the thought of it crushed my soul. How could people actually survive such an existence, let alone thrive in it? The people who'd come from that building for their break had the same harried look as those children in the factories. How could we come full cycle like this? Hooded one, can we go now? Thankfully, that was affirmative and it offered me a sleeve. Thanks for listening to episode 190D of the E6S Methods podcast. Be sure to get your free copy of A Business Carol and share it with a friend. Break the bread and spread it around. Stay tuned for episode 190E to wrap up the whole story. Jacob and I are working on an entire new catalog of episodes for 2018. If there's anything in particular you'd like to know more about, now's the time to let us know. Just email me, Aaron, A-A-R-O-N, at e6s-methods.com. Until then, have a great holiday and continue to enjoy the rest of 2017. Cheers.